Activity picks up with some big flare players that are keeping radio blackouts on the menu. And a solar storm launch with the help of a couple corona holes could make it a bit more Earth-directed. Those stories and more are in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash SWEN. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week picks up in activity quite a bit. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we do have a lot of active regions in Earth view, and some of them are big flare players. In fact, as we take a look at the uh, east limb of the of the sun, you can see region 4325, boom, right there, fires off an M5.1 class flare. This was at an R2 level radio blackout. It even has a solar storm launches from both this region and this region, because so they're sympathetically tied together. So we're going to be watching these regions as they rotate in through the Earth strike zone, because they could definitely be giving us a chance for more solar storms, Earth-directed solar storms, in fact. However, what we have been really paying attention to is region 4317, Right around the 27th, it started becoming a bit flare active. And by the 28th, it's actually beginning to fire off little flares. But uh, late on the 28th, it finally fires a big solar storm. You can see it, boom, right there. This was an M... Uh of what 4.1 flare if i recall nearly an r2 level radio blackout but along with that came out a solar storm in fact as we take a look at it more impressive from the big detailed view here you can watch this set of regions you can see some dimming regions open up on either side boom right there isn't that beautiful now let me walk that back because if you think of just this region here you're thinking oh okay this is kind of in the northwestern quadrant of the earth strike zone so maybe we'll get a little something but let me show you something that makes you raise your eyebrows a little bit as i back it up okay so we see that there's going to be dimming regions here but watch your eye let your eye follow this region all the way down in here and look for kind of a puffy pattern right here when this dimming region opens up okay ready so watch it here as it begins to play whoosh do you see that and did you see the kind of puffy little wave that goes through here what that i'm backing it up a little bit for you so you can see it watch it open up again see all that and that all the way out to here so the interesting thing is that it means that we're not just getting a small solar storm launch from this region it means the whole overlying arcade down in this region in here down right above the northern part of this coronal hole is actually being evacuated to some degree and that has implications in terms of how the solar storm looks and actually what it's going to be its behavior is going to be like but we'll talk more about that in a second it also explains what we see in coronagraphs right we get this first little poof up here but then if you continue watching it look you get something else down in this region here well this is exactly what we're talking about is this partial evacuation of stuff in this area so we need to study this a little bit more don't we because it's not quite exactly as it seems so now as we take a look at this structure the surroundings or which it actually launched it's actually quite complicated you can see there's a corona hole here to the east at the northern part of the structure and there's a corona hole that's sitting kind of to the southwest on the southern part of the structure. So what does that do exactly? Well, as we get a better look at the overlying coronal arcades, you can see there's lots of loops that kind of go like this, right? Notice that where this structure launched, it would be lifting out all of these loops outward, kind of going just to the west of Earth. But this coronal hole, the fast wind from this coronal hole is going to serve to kind of take that structure and push it, kind of like tilt it off to the west. And this coronal hole here Notice it's on the other side. It's going to take the, this structure and want to push it up this way. So if you have a long structure like this, and you've got this side, this coronal hole pushing this way, and you've got this coronal hole pushing this way, well, this whole long structure might actually start to cartwheel. <laughs> Strangely enough, these things do this, actually. So this solar storm may, instead of being completely north-south, may actually twist and kind of bend and cartwheel to actually tilt more east-west. 
And if that actually happens, well, we could actually see more of an Earth-directed structure than we actually thought. But we'll talk more about that when we get to the modeling and the visualizer. Meanwhile, let's just talk a little bit more about this corona hole here. You can see as we move further up in this corona with this, this blue sun, you can see that the deep part of the coronal hole is definitely here. But we do have a little bit of some open field lines. You can even see that with the, the coronal model here. You can see that there is a bit of open field, which means some fast solar wind will be coming from this region as well. And that means that the fast solar wind that we're going to expect hitting us down maybe sometime late on the 30th into the 31st could actually linger through the first and possibly a little bit into the second before things calm down. So aurora photographers, even if this solar storm, this glancing solar storm blow doesn't quite hit Earth, well, we are going to expect a bit of fast solar wind, so you could still see a decent show right about New Year's. And now switching to our full sun map, we are still using SDO AIA imagery for the front side of the sun, but we cannot use solar orbiter imagery because solar orbiter is also looking at the front side of the sun just like we are. So we do have to use JSOC uh, HMI helioseismology farsighted viewing for the far side, and you can see that here in gold. Now to get you oriented for the full sun, you can see region 4317, that is the region that just launched that big solar storm that may be Earth directed. But you can also see this huge cluster of, of dark regions here from the far side. This cluster ended up being regions 4325 and 4323, along with region 4324. You can see them rotating here. These are the big regions that we were expecting to have massive, you know, big uh, flares and radio blackouts. We've gotten a little bit of them, but it's a little bit more underwhelming than we anticipated. So I'm not expecting the, the big X-class flare risk to jump really high with this particular bunch. Now, on top of that, we will in the next day or so get old region 4299. This was a region that maybe two rotations ago did have some big flare player uh, attitude, but it's calmed down significantly, so I don't think we're going to see all that much from it. The only other thing we're thinking of, of being an issue for uh, amateur radio operators and emergency responders might be regions 4303 and 4305. We do have some, some activity going on here in this set. These guys will be rotating into Earth view in about three to five days, so likely we'll get maybe a little bit more activity, but for the most part, it looks like all the big flare players are in Earth view now. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders understand that right now, if you can deal with the next maybe week or week and a half, uh, things will be quieting down in terms of radio noise on the dayside radio bands, as well as the risk for big radio blackouts. And then we'll likely have a calm period of possibly another two weeks before things get active again. And now returning to that solar storm that we launched that could be Earth-directed, we switch to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now as I set this solar storm model in motion, you can see that solar storm launching to the west of Earth here in just a moment. There you go. It's kind of small and slow, heading more towards stereo A. But this structure is supposed to give Earth just a little bit of a bump, as you can see right here, uh, early on the 1st, possibly late on the, the 31st. But according to NOAA, it's really not going to give us much of an impact at all. So, uh, you know, it's, and this is if the fast solar wind from those coronal holes don't really affect it all that much. But if we take a look at NASA's version of the model, now again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. If I set this model in motion, you're going to see a slightly different picture. This one is going to be a bit more Earth directed, as you can see. In fact, when we expect it to hit, it'll hit basically right on New Year's. So they think it's maybe a little bit faster than NOAA expects and a little bit more Earth directed. And likely the truth may be somewhere in the middle. These are pretty good brackets of what we expect. And how do we know this? Well, it's more to do with the, the 3D visualization. So let me go ahead and flip to that where we're back at NOAA's model. And now I've overlaid the, the 3D visualizer you'll see here and I'll follow it out. You can kind of see just to get you oriented what we expect to see from this structure. So as we take a look at it in three dimensions, we can flip this now on its side so you can see there's Earth over here. And you can see this is actually the lemnus kit that from the NASA uh, fit to this structure. But what we've done is we've actually taken a look at the coronagraph images from 
Earth, meaning Soho, Alaska, as well as from Stereo A. And we've gotten an idea of how tilted the flux rope structure should be. And that's this blue structure in here. How tilted that structure should be based on the constraints of those images as best we can. So it's still a bit of a, a, you know, kind of a guessing game here, but at least it's an, an educated guess. So as we have this structure blow out, what we've done is we've aligned Earth with the sun. So this is now the view we'd expect to see this from Earth as this structure begins to move out. And you can see right now, without any change or any cartwheeling of this particular flux rope, we would expect that it's not going to hit Earth at all because the leg, even the southern leg, is going to go well underneath uh, the, the ecliptic plane where the Earth is. So we're not going to get hit by this structure. But as we mentioned before, we have a coronal hole that was going to be pushing on the east edge of the structure in the northern hemisphere from the fast solar wind flow. And in the southern hemisphere, the, the fast solar wind from the coronal hole is going to be pushing on the west side. So what happens when you push on this side and you push on this side simultaneously? This whole structure could actually tilt more and become more east-west instead of north-south. If you notice, this is very north-south, but it could tilt more east-west. And if that happens, you're not gonna get a structure that looks like this, you're gonna get a structure that looks like this in its angle. So if that happens, we could actually see the southern part of this uh, leg from this solar storm actually rise all the way up to actually encase Earth. So if that does happen, that means that that flank of that structure could in fact give Earth a bit of a a little bit more than a glancing blow. So that would mean that NASA's model will be the more correct one. So we're just going to have to wait and see as the structure blows out and as that fast wind does its thing, perhaps Earth could get a solar storm after all for New Year's. And now switching to our moon, we are now passing through the first quarter phase on our way to a full moon with a full moon being on the third. And by the fifth, the moon will still be about 94% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you wanna catch those dim objects in the sky, well, you're gonna have this bright companion. So you're gonna to need to check your local rise and set times. And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the fast solar wind that's gonna be hitting us along with that a possible solar storm glancing blow. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active to possibly minor storm conditions, but up to about a 30% chance for a major storm. And that's going to happen around, starting around the 30th in through the 31st and the 1st, but things should be settling down shortly after that. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a show for New Year's. And now at mid latitudes, while we are still expecting that wind watch and we do have the storm watch, but we're only expecting unsettled to active conditions because this is not going to be a super strong solar storm if it does end up hitting us. But aurora photographers, well, we do have about a 35% chance of a minor storm right around the first. So only if you're dedicated should you chase, but you definitely could get some issue, uh, some aurora shows with those substorms that pop on and off every now and again. So if you chase substorms, you're in good shape, but things will then settle down after about the second. Uh, and then we're going to have to look for those other players, those big flare players and solar storm producers for our next show. And now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting well into the triple digits for solar flux. And this is because we have a lot of active regions in Earth view, and some of them are big flare players. We are expecting moderate noise on the dayside radio bands for this, and that's likely going to last all week. In fact, NOAA's giving us about a 55% chance of M-class flares at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and even about a 10% chance of X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout. This is easily going to last over the next three days. I've extended it through the five day just in case some of the new regions rotating into Earth view end up being big flare players too. But expect to see that solar flux slowly begin to kind of diminish over the course of this week. And as we roll into next week, likely the risk for radio blackouts will have diminished. And also that dayside radio noise will also have gone down quite a bit. 
And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Everything is in the green when it comes to big radiation storms right now. We are sitting at the D1 normal range for you aviators at flight level 360. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. We are having about a 10% chance of a radiation storm at the S1 to S2 level, and that's easily over the next three days, but I'm going to push it out through the five day just in case the flare players on in Earth view uh, end up getting a bit more active than they are right now. So uh, you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and you, and you uh, high risk passengers, please pay attention to those ICAO advisories because everything is in the green right now, but you never know because things can change quite quickly. So the space weather this week is looking pretty good. We do have a lot of active regions in Earth view, and some of them are big flare players as well as solar storm producers. In fact, we do have that solar storm that's on its way. So roar photographers, if you're at high latitudes, along with that fast solar wind, you could be seeing shows starting around the 30th and in through the 31st and even into New Year's Day. But aurora photographers at mid latitudes likely going to be around New Year's Eve to New Year's Day, but you're going to have to chase those substorms if you want to catch a nice show. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, thankfully, things aren't as crazy as we expected them to be. It's slightly more subdued. We are still getting R1 to R2 level radio blackouts, and that's likely going to continue on and off for the next maybe week or so. But if you can hang on there, things will get better. And now uh, you GPS users, well, along, along with that fast solar wind and solar storms, you do have those radio blackouts. So both the night side and the day side are being impacted, but not too badly. So as long as you stay away from Aurora on the night side and away from dawn and dusk, Ask, well, your GPS reception should be pretty good. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.